See if someone here can guess what is the number one thing over which people become depressed. Anybody take a guess, number one thing people become depressed over? Money? Nope, nope. Sex? Nope, nope. nope. <laughs> if, we could, if we could avoid the personal testimonies this morning, I would appreciate it. Okay, let's see, we have, let's see, we have money and sex, I guess that covers the entire sphere of the human experience. <laughs> Actually, the number one thing over which people become depressed is their physical appearance. So I want you to turn to the person beside you and say, you're the best looking person I've seen all day. <laughs> okay. And I say to you, some of the things in our life that we lose, it could be a lot worse. As we all get older and you begin to lose your looks, at least you still have your health. If you lost a customer, look on the bright side. Somebody in this room found him. <laughs> now, I'm not advocating that we're supposed to live our lives with a blind reality denying optimism. I mean, when real tragedy or frustration comes into our life, we need to experience that pain, that anguish. I'm not saying we go around denying reality. But let's be honest about it, folks. A large percentage of the things we get upset over, depressed over, stressed out over are so petty and trivial and insignificant, they don't even deserve to be mentioned. Like spoiled children, we get upset because we didn't get our way or somebody didn't treat us in the fashion we wanted them to. These are the things over which I am saying we can exercise mastery. My wife and I were devastated some years ago. The doctors told us we couldn't have any children. At first we got all depressed about it. And we decided, what good is this depression doing? We decided to act on the most positive solution we had, which is to adopt in the last few years, we've adopted two happy little girls. Now we want to adopt a whole house full of kids. If I can be out there, if you know the kid needs to be adopted, let me know. <laughs> Tell you the truth, my wife would like an infant. I want to get the one that's old enough to mow the grass. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'll tell you, a few years ago, we looked at infertility as a curse. Well, I swear to you, I love my daughter so much that I am literally glad that we had fertility problems. Because otherwise, I never would have gotten to know them, and they probably would have ended up with very difficult lives. Well, what's the difference? A few years ago, we looked at infertility as a curse. And now I promise you, I look at it as a blessing. Understand this. More than anything else, the attitude that we have in life toward the adversity that we face is the result of what we value. But we human beings are highly irrational. We are not very logical. An old cowboy philosopher said, people are not logical. If they were, it would be men who rode side saddle. <laughs> Too often we allow that irrational side of our mind to dominate our thought process. I don't want you to understand something. I'm talking about achieving a balance in our perspective. You see, the world throws so much negative at us every day that we have to consciously counteract it so we can have this balanced view. But I don't care how much discipline you exercise in trying to achieve this balanced perspective. If we allow ourselves to associate with people who are always moaning and groaning and complaining, it will impact our attitude. You see, all of us in here, we like to think of ourselves as individuals. And to a large extent, we are. And yet, we are highly influenced by the attitudes and the philosophies and the beliefs of the people with whom we associate. And you think about this a second. You think about the most neurotic, negative people you know, and usually at the core of their neuroses is an obsession with themselves, their needs, their wants, their desires. Do you think about the most consistently joyful people you know, and generally at the core of their joy is the satisfaction they derive from encouraging and serving others. Aren't you the Michael Broom that came to our school and talked to the kids? We thought you were wonderful. <laughs> sure, come on inside. <laughs> I got about 5,000 cookies at home now. But she gave me encouragement and every day we have the opportunity to do that to people around us to encourage them and if there's a reason for us to be affirmative thinkers other than the benefit it gives us personally is because none of us in here are going to be able to positively influence the lives of our employees, our customers, our family if we're walking around like a little boy who just lost his favorite pocket knife. I hate to say to people sometimes, you say, hey, Joe, how you doing? They'll say, great. <laughs> I feel like telling him, well, if you're doing great, why don't you tell your face about it? <laughs> what can you do? to enhance a relationship with your customers. Look for the little things. Secondly is this statement, and this rule is probably even more important. Never promise more than you are willing to deliver. 
It's better to focus on doing fewer things and do them in an excellent capacity than it is to try to be all things to all customers and end up functioning on a mediocre level. You look at the market leaders in practically any area of our economy, and generally they are the market leaders because they focus, focus, focus on doing fewer things but doing them better than anyone else. Never promise more than you're willing to deliver. I experienced that going to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I went by this little greasy spoon restaurant. Had a big sign out front. It said, all the orange juice you could drink for 50 cents. I thought, great, I love orange juice. Pulled in, sat down the counter, plopped down my 50 cents. He poured me a glass of orange juice. I gulped it down. I said, let me have some more. He poured me another glass of orange juice. I gulped that down. He says, that'll be 50 cents. I said, I just gave you 50 cents. The sign says, all you could drink for 50 cents. He said, that's right. That's all you could drink for 50 cents. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, let me have a hamburger. He plopped down the greasiest looking hamburger I've ever seen. He said, you're going to eat it here or take it with you? I said, well, I hope to do both. <laughs> I said, let me have a cup of coffee. He poured me a cup of coffee. I said, is that regular or decaf? He said, what do you want? I said, decaf. He said, then that's what it is. <laughs> but never promise more than you are willing to deliver. Now here's the third rule I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, and you might not agree with what I'm about to say. And that's okay, because if two of us agree with everything, then one of us isn't necessary. But here's the statement. The longer we are in business, the more out of touch we get with the needs of our customers. The longer we're in business, the more out of touch we get with the needs of our customers. Now some people say, wait a second, that's not true. The longer you're in business, the more experience you have, the more knowledge you acquire, the more proficient you become. Well, that should be the case. And I'll grant you, with some people it is the case, but generally it is not the case, and I think I can prove it to you. You look at the companies who were in the Fortune 500 list 25 years ago, well over half of them are not there today. Well, why? If experience was such a good teacher, that list should change very little. Once you made it to the top, you'd stay there because you have the knowledge, the experience, the expertise. Well, that list is constantly changing, constantly evolving. Why? Because companies begin to take employees for granted. Employees start taking the company for granted. Together, they take the customers for granted. They get stuck in ruts and routines. They become too easily satisfied with mediocrity. They resist change. They become apathetic in their relationships. You see this apathy occurring in marriages. You women, remember the first time your husband came to pick you up on a date before you were married? He thought there was some competition then. He wanted to be at his best. He told you to be ready at 7 o'clock, half an hour after 7, he was still patiently waiting for you. You walked out the car, he opened the door for you, set you down, took you out to a great place to eat. How about after you've been married a number of years? It's your anniversary. He says, get ready, you're going to Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Remember, women, how he used to open the car door for you? Now you got to open your own car door, you still got one foot on the curb and he takes off. You're driving down the interstate at night in a rainstorm. You have a flat tire. He doesn't even hold the flashlight steady for you. <laughs> but what is it? We've got to combat that tendency inside of us to take our relationships for granted. And what is it we're competing to do? The thing that we're competing to do is to serve. That's what, first of all, we are and should be, is servants. The most successful entrepreneurs, leaders, servants first.